uh, preeclampsia, uh, just to break it down, it's uh, when someone has high blood pressure mm. and this uh, particularly comes to... You've said it affects both mother and child. Are there any other complications that you can expect after delivery? Okay. So, uh, uh, very thankfully, mm. um, the treatment for preeclampsia is actually delivery. Mm. Uh, but we do have a few women who do get complications even after. The, so it's like you remove the placenta, mm. the disease should stop yeah. and we start having recovery. Yeah. So in fact, like what we tell our postgraduate students, uh, prognosis in a mother who you've diagnosed uh, preeclampsia and has been well managed mm. is that you expect recovery. So all those mm. complications, you've, the kidneys, uh, the tests we're doing, they were work, we expect them to start coming back down. Mm. To normal. The liver, the same, everything we expect to settle yeah, after, after we remove, delivery. To remove the mm. placenta. An estimated 1.1 million Kenyans fall into poverty each year. And that's because of healthcare costs. Would Sha Shi UHC change that or is there more? Or perhaps, what's the difference between a pharmacy with a blue cross and a green cross? What about cancer and the rising incidence amongst the youth? Is it just lifestyle changes or is there more? Women's health, men's health, your children's health, the economy, this and more awaits you on season two of Kenya's favorite health podcast. My name is Dr. Diana Wangarugitao, and welcome to season two of the One Health Lens Podcast. Hi, and welcome back to yet another episode of the One Health Lens podcast. This is the explained edition where we get more in depth into the conversations and the topics that we have, because a lot of these health conversations are very technical, they're very intense, and we want to just mellow it down. We want to make it something that, you know, you can relate to. And I'm joined today by Dr. Maureen Oviti, who is the lovely, lovely medical practitioner, and we're going to have a conversation about about preeclampsia. I know this is something that has been in the media recently because we have a very prominent leader who expressed that he could be suffering from the, the same condition, but this condition is just confined to a specific group of people. So we want to get into it and to understand what is preeclampsia. Welcome, Dr. Maureen. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm feeling great. Yeah. I'm just about to start burst out laughing. Because <laughs> of what you're yeah, 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 because it was a very interesting thing mm -hmm. cause, uh, to think about something that's confined to particularly expectant women and a gentleman <laughs> is saying that he's suffering from the same condition. Mm -hmm. So we want to really dissect this and get into it because so many people do not really understand what preeclampsia is. So could you probably give us an intro? What is preeclampsia? Okay. Just because you've taken me there, I was going to be saying, eh, we're in the era of alphabets, maybe uh, it's an alphabet type. <laughs> you, you could have been transgender. Yeah, <laughs> we never know. <laughs> anyway, back to, uh, back to the conversation. Mm, uh, preeclampsia, uh, just to break it down, it's uh, when someone has high blood pressure. Mm. And this uh, particularly comes during pregnancy. And it's associated with specific symptoms. And that would be in the urine. When we check the urine, mm -hmm. we'll find things like proteins mm -hmm. in the urine and the elevated blood pressure. So it's uh, we used to have a triad of symptoms, but we narrowed it down to just um, problems in the urine yeah. associated with blood pressure in a pregnant woman. So not even mm, not all women yeah. can have preeclampsia. You have to be pregnant mm. to experience uh, preeclampsia. If you're not pregnant and you have high blood pressure, that's just hypertension. Yeah. Okay. So um, hypertensive states in pregnancy are several. So you find we have gestational hypertension. Mm -hmm. So that would just be because of the pregnancy, your blood pressure is up. But when we check your kidney, we find your urine. We don't have the proteins in the urine. Okay. Um, now... Um, for the definition also, we look at in diagnosing severe cases, uh, sometimes um, 
we're able to see that if we have high blood pressure, mm-hmm. I don't have those changes in the urine, but we have other features. So very high blood pressure, mm. maybe there are changes in the liver functions. Um, like when we check the liver, the yeah. enzymes that we look at, uh, they're elevated or deranged. Okay. Or uh, if we check um, the lungs, we find that we're able to find some changes in the lungs or any other complication related because uh, preeclampsia, when we have, we now classify it as with severe features mm. and without severe features. Okay. okay. So um, when you have any of those severe features, but you don't necessarily have the proteins in the urine, we can still classify you as having uh, preeclampsia. Oh. But um, it's a life-threatening condition, uh, especially those who have the severe features. Yeah. With the worst case coming, you can actually get convulsions. So full-blown preeclampsia, we now call eclampsia, oh. when you have convulsions. So for those maybe not familiar with the term convulsions, I think everyone knows epilepsy. Yeah. So when we have those fits, like someone mm. who has epilepsy, yeah. along with the high blood pressure in a pregnant woman, we now call that eclampsia. Mm. And now that is a real life-threatening uh, condition. condition. Um, some women do die without even getting the convulsions because, as I said, you can go into liver failure, you can go into kidney failure. Yeah. So the most common causes of death would be the convulsions mm. or uh, kidney failure uh, due to the disease. And that's fascinating because you've you've said it's particularly for expectant women. You have to be pregnant. Yes. That's the condition, number yes, one. Yes, yes. And it's closely tied to the kidney functions. Yes. Why is it? Like, how? what is the relation between uh, preeclampsia, the, the high blood pressure, and the kidney aspect? Is it because the protein is in your system, perhaps? Is it because of your diet? Is it because of your lifestyle? What triggers the high protein that's found in the urine? Okay, so again, um, that's one of the most common uh, features mm. of preeclampsia. And what happens is that your blood vessels uh, is kind of like they leak so mm. that you have... Um, all the fluid is going out into the tissues. And oh. with it goes also the cellular uh, the cellular parts. Oh, so no. you find yeah. um, you have um, a lot of... You're actually dehydrated inside yeah. your blood vessels. Mm. But you find like preeclampsia, you'll find like they're puffy, they're swollen all over, the fingers yeah. are all swollen and, and, and things like that. And that's just because... Uh, there's a shift in terms of the oncotic, sorry, the blood, the the, the levels. So mm. if you have, uh, um, if you have a high protein somewhere, mm-hmm. the it's like the water is going to be pulled, it's going to be pulled oh. out. Okay, so just to make it less technical, it's something I feel what is important for maybe your audience uh, to be aware is um, like. People don't like attending clinic, mm. but I think uh, the best people always are first-time mothers. Yeah. They're very diligent in how they attend their, <laughs> uh, their, their The clinics, clinics and everything, because yeah, it's your first experience, it's, it's, you're yes. cautious. But it's something that can happen even like you didn't have this problem in a previous pregnancy. It can happen uh. in a subsequent pregnancy. Mm. But the clinic visits, we monitor something as simple as your blood pressure. Yeah. And just that reading of your blood pressure can save your life yeah it can actually save your life it can because if someone notices your blood pressure is going up they're able to do more um intensive tests Mm. to ensure that you don't have any other complication and we're able to manage that blood pressure so that you don't get um you don't get complications yeah but the interesting thing about the blood pressure medication the blood pressure medication it just controls the blood pressure Mm. But it doesn't stop the disease from getting worse. Mm, okay? yeah, yeah. So we really need to make sure we're able to monitor the blood pressure and uh, check for any complications that will arise because mm, of the, the rising blood pressure. blood pressure. Yeah. So as I've said, we classify to those who have severe features mm-hmm. and those who don't have severe features. Mm. So if you don't have the severe features, it's just more frequent. So your clinic visits will be more frequent because you have to keep an eye mm. uh, on the complications. Mm. But we can be managed at home. Interesting. Yeah. But the moment we say somebody has severe features, 
So that it's a high risk. That's high risk. Yeah. We have to admit. Oh. Yes. We have to admit uh, that patient. They have to undergo a lot of intensive um, follow up. Mm. So we take uh, we take their blood. We do ultrasounds just to see how we can push how far we can push the pregnancy. Yeah. Because you have to get that sweet balance whereby we're not compromising the mother mm-hmm. and also not compromising the baby. Yeah. So you understand that this disease, the mother's affected, and but the, the baby baby's is also well. going to be affected because the basic disease happens at the placental level. Oh, okay? yeah. So you find you want to control blood pressures, but your baby has been used to high blood pressures. Yeah. You lower the mother's blood pressure. The baby is baby, affected. They get to affect the baby. So you really have to get that... Like a balance. It's a very sweet balance of this is the right time to deliver the baby. Mm. Now, unfortunately, it's like it's very difficult to to tell when exactly you should do that. But yeah. with the frequent monitoring experience, and we're very happy now have what we call the fetal maternal uh, specialists mm. who are able to do very detailed scans mm, that are able fetus. to tell us uh, is this baby at risk mm. or not. So if we find the baby is at risk we'll have to deliver. Mm. If the mother is at risk, we have to deliver. Yeah. And um, any baby that's born before time, it's a very, very big cost yeah. to both the mother and, and, the, child. and the child because yeah. being in hospital, hospital bills, also just the stress you can imagine with the newborn. Yeah. And, I, and you entire... know, you were just talking about all this and it's it, it sounds very, very intense. The entire experience, the just the condition alone and the the way you're talking about in case it's severe, it's a high risk mm. uh, situation, then you have to monitor mother, baby and then figure out. When's the right time to deliver? When you know, <laughs> I was just thinking about those movies where they talk about we're either saving this, the mom, or the child, and then it's a very hard spot to pick between the two. And I'm wondering, does preeclampsia occur maybe in the first trimester, the second, or the third? At what stage does it occur? Because I can imagine if it's coming at the first trimester, then how can you manage to save that child, particularly if it's something that's high risk? Okay. So uh, fortunately, it's not something that happens in the first trimester. However, those changes, st- what we call, as I said, it's at the level of the placenta, the mm-hmm. disease. Yeah. Um, and there are some changes we see when we do ultrasounds that tell us that this patient has a high risk of developing preeclampsia. Mm. So we do have um, some medication that we're able to give mothers. Yeah. Those, like, for example, a mother had preeclampsia in a previous pregnancy. Mm. We definitely have to put such a patient on aspirin. Yeah. And aspirin is very cheap and readily available. Yeah, everywhere. everywhere okay? mm. And you find. So uh, in as much as I'm saying it's like a prophylaxis trying to prevent, it doesn't necessarily prevent you from getting preeclampsia. Yeah. But what happens, it delays onset of severe symptoms. Uh. So maybe... You were supposed to get severe symptoms at 24 weeks. Mm. We were able to get you 28 weeks. Yeah. And in obstetrics, obstetrics is the study of women when they are pregnant. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We always ask what's the difference between obstetrics and gynecology. Yeah. yeah so yeah. Uh, we look after the reproductive health system of both pregnant and non-pregnant women. Mm. So when you're pregnant, I'll be an obstetrician. Yeah, <laughs> when you're not, you're a gynecologist. Yes, and when you're not pregnant, I'm a gynecologist. But just yeah. we make people's lives easier. We just say gynecologist. Gyna slash OB. Yeah, everybody understands that. Yeah. So, um, so uh, what we're saying about the that? So just taking something as simple as aspirin. Aspirin can delay, will delay onset. So for obstetrics, I was saying, um, every week can make a difference. So if you're going to deliver. A preterm baby. Mm. Every any day you can buy, any week you can buy yeah. for that baby, can drastically change the outcome. Because yeah. you must remember, you deliver a preterm baby. This baby is at risk. Obviously, biggest thing is death. Yeah, and also a lot of complications. They mm. have complications with their nervous system. They can develop things like cerebral palsy. Yeah, they get infections. 
very easily so you really don't want to deliver especially what we call a severely preterm infant yeah so we want to buy time get this to mother push it. as close as term as possible mm. and but i think we should we should probably clarify it's it, the the full term is about 39 weeks a full term is from 37 mm-hmm. to uh 40 40 weeks 40 weeks yeah. and also the baby develops certain features mm-hmm. uh depending on the the week of uh the growth where they're at it's so, just understanding mm-hmm. um baby is has all the organs yeah but in terms of maturity yeah of those organs to live outside they're not yet ready yeah okay? mm. so when you deliver the baby early mm. this baby now gets risks because their organs are just yeah. not yet ready for outside they're vulnerable yes, because yeah. they're still delicate they're mm. still growing yeah. and you know trying to to get to maturity yes. where they can exist outside of yes. the womb. Yeah, yeah. So when you try and push the dates, the weeks, it's better for your child better because the then baby. they're developing more and more and that they, they, they can at least survive. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think that's something that we should have clarified because some, someone could be listening and wondering, uh, what's the point? Mm. What's the point of all this? <laughs> okay. But yeah. with preeclampsia and especially mm. someone who has severe features, mm. the problem is the more time you buy, Mm. the more damage you're going to get. I remember mm. we've talked about very vital organs. Yeah. Mm. We're talking about your kidney, we're talking about your liver, we're talking about mm. your brain. We're talking about... And preeclampsia, I think it affects every single system. There's no system that's not affected Yeah. Uh, when you have uh, severe preeclampsia. And is there anything? Is it because you probably had blood pressure before? Is there any condition that exists before that can increase your risk of getting preeclampsia? Okay. Or can it happen to just anyone? Okay, definitely you have people who have, we know, are at higher risk of getting preeclampsia. So definitely somebody who had preeclampsia in a previous pregnancy, we expect that they're going to get in a subsequent pregnancy. Yeah. We have people who have, say, multiple gestations, mm. people who have diabetic obese uh and those who have uh chronic hypertension on them on themselves so like those people who have hypertension yeah. as a disease entity by themselves and uh anyone with say a kidney kidney uh, disease mm. uh, those are some of the people who could be at higher risk of developing preeclampsia yeah but let's just say it's a first time pregnancy mm. it's very difficult for us to say um that that you can or you can't yeah. Mm, and it's interestingly, a give or take. the paternity also plays a role. Oh, yes. interesting. Very interesting. So you mm-hmm. find um, you've had, like I, I've had a situation mm-hmm. whereby um, I talked to this mother and it was actually a colleague. Yeah. And she's had a baby before. Mm-hmm. So you asked, did you have any complications in the previous pregnancy? And um, she had not had any complications of previous pregnancy so yeah we thought we're fine yeah oh she got preeclampsia it's a oh, features. No. and it turns out yeah that her first child was with a different partner ah uh, so you can imagine so so now you also have to go back it's questions oh like, no is, now is, we is have to find out the, the <laughs> man <laughs> <laughs> now we have to test the guy and be like no no, no. Tell you me can't test the guy uh, mm. we don't know we don't know but uh it's it's like uh paternity does play a role oh. in terms of development of the disease so yeah with her first partner she didn't have an issue but with yeah. her second partner but then how can you check is that the way you're saying There's you can't nowhere. test so 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 <sighs> it's it, so it unfortunate was, it, was, it was it was very interesting yeah so you you're, so from that experience, I'm not like, now, do I ask every patient who's on a second pregnancy, is like, this the same father? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and do you know how awkward like, that conversation is? Like, yes, just tell me the truth. Like, uh, really, dog? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, in this day and time, honestly, yeah. it's there's a possibility of that. Because mm-hmm. people have multiple partners. And you know, maybe one situation didn't work out and then you're with this other person. And it could change. Mm. But then how do you bring up questions like that? How do you even inquire? Because most people, I assume, mm-hmm. they don't know why you're trying to ask this. They don't yes. know that you're trying to figure out something that could affect their health. They're just like, mm, unim daku. <laughs> <laughs> like, why are you curious? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But what are, what are some of the anyway. things? You've talked about looking at blood pressure. Mm-hmm. 
you check that you have to monitor that what are other things that you have to monitor in an expectant woman just to know if they're they're at risk of it or not okay so as i've said um i think we didn't finish the the question so mm. the disease itself normally doesn't manifest before 20 weeks uh. having had said that if i look at i clearly remember when i just graduated from med school mm -hmm. it was very rare to find people at 20 24 weeks and mm -hmm. they're having this uh, uh severe features yeah so what has changed i honestly don't know yeah and i think over time we're actually going to relook mm -hmm. and uh probably say that this thing actually can start before in the first uh oh. or early sec uh, early second trimester or even before 20 weeks because you find at 24 weeks you're getting convulsions and there's nothing else mm. you can explain. So yeah. why we're getting uh, at such young gestations, such severe complications, it's 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 very interesting. So yeah. I, I can't explain. Uh, we have not yet been able to explain, but f for me very clearly, I can look at when I started practice and now, we're seeing much more severe complications mm. earlier. Whether are they maybe people are coming to the hospital? Mm. There, there's more access to to hospitals. Were they dying at yeah. home and nobody knew mm. what happened? Yeah. That could also be it. But um, that's what I feel that over time we may look at and our threshold because we normally see if it's before twenty weeks of pregnancy, mm. uh, we're not necessarily going to call that uh, preeclampsia. Mm. Uh, but the changes in the blood vessels at the placenta already start occurring from the time the placenta is being formed. Yeah. And that's what we monitor and say, oh, this is somebody who looks like she's at risk. Yeah. Let's put them on um, aspirin therapy. Mm. So other than the people that the, the groups of people that I mentioned, mm. those are also people who would benefit yeah. from taking um, aspirin. Yeah. Uh, there's also some association with calcium in the mm -hmm. diet, mm -hmm. uh, but they say if you uh, you check calcium levels are low, uh, those people may benefit from calcium supplementation, mm -hmm. but you find aspirin is a more widespread uh, mm -hmm. use yeah. uh, for trying to, um, let's just say, delay onset of the symptoms so that we're able to get a much, much bigger baby mm -hmm. and a mother with less complications. Yeah. yeah. And now I'm wondering, after you've delivered the child and the the mother had preeclampsia you've said it affects both mother and child are there any other complications that you can expect after delivery okay so uh, uh, very thankfully mm. um, the treatment for preeclampsia is actually delivery mm. uh, but we do have a few women who do get complications even after the, so it's like you remove the placenta mm. the disease should stop yeah and we start having recovery yeah so in fact like what we tell our postgraduate students uh, prognosis in a mother who you've diagnosed uh, preeclampsia and has been well managed mm. is that you expect recovery so all those mm. complications you've the kidneys uh the tests we're doing they were work we expect them to start coming back down mm. to normal the liver the same everything we expect to settle yeah, after, after we remove, delivery, we remove the mm. placenta. I know I'm making it sound very simple. <laughs> <laughs> and people are thinking, oh my God, first yes. I'm dealing with all these complications, yes. then the yes. delivery itself. Yes. Mm. But um, depending on the severity of the complications, mm. so there are those if we are not able to get them in time or we don't make timely decisions, mm. uh, we'll be left with a lifelong kidney problems oh. uh, there are those uh, for example you had uh, a bleed in the brain some mm. are left with yeah very severe complications so it's something we must do must make every effort so i keep maintaining um there's no other way yeah. it's clinic so that you're undergoing the surveillance mm. um your blood pressure is taken your urine is checked just and just such basic simple steps Mm. can make such a difference between you going home. Yeah. Yeah. Like um, uh, we we have, for me, a, a very complicated situation is whereby we've said, we've diagnosed this mother and we said she has severe features. Mm. And we've reached a point whereby we don't think it's safe for the pregnancy to continue. Mm. And we're at 28 weeks. Mm. And the mother is obviously concerned that if you deliver 
or even 24 weeks. Yeah. She's like, if you deliver this baby, will it survive? Yeah. And you have to look at the mother and tell her, look, uh, where we are, um, we are technically, uh, because as obstetricians, you're like, you, have to, you tell us, you have to choose between the mother yeah. and the baby. Um, for me, as a w- woman doctor, our school is that we preserve the mother at all costs. Mm. So we do have to make that call whereby we are technically like sacrificing the baby. Mm. But I thank God for modern medicine. Yeah. In a good unit, in a good unit, um, these children still do have a chance of mm. survival. Mm. But uh, you find in some public spaces, uh, the issue is not so much the knowledge the issue is the availability of the resources. So you find yeah. an incubator. Uh, you're not able to have an incubator by yourself. You're sharing. Mm, yeah. And the moment you're sharing, infection. Then the risks are uh, higher. All of that. So mm. these kids die not because uh, we don't know how to look after them, mm. but just you're not able to give them the ideal um, conditions mm. uh, to survive. But uh, in an ideal setting, they can survive. Um so, as I said, for the obstetrician, for me, at all costs, we must ensure the mother goes home. Yeah. She must go home. Yeah. And you preserve you the, to, the life of you the have mom. To look at her and say, look, mm. uh, where we are, yes, um, I cannot guarantee the baby is going to go home. Mm. But if we don't deliver, you're also at risk of also not going home. Mm. We can send you to your maker. And um, that will be we, unfortunate. We don't want to go that direction yeah. so but we've had some situations where the mothers are completely they don't want to uh, make that decision mm-hmm. so it, it really it's it, numbers i'd say would be the challenges of yeah. um, managing of such, your practice yeah, of managing i can patients. imagine yeah so um uh some things you leave to god yeah and i tell mothers at least if it's above 28 weeks uh, the kid should be fine uh, with the not right the kid resources. Will be fine. It's still, it's still, it's still touch and go. It's still touch mm. and go. But the chances are pretty good uh, mm. for the baby to go home. Yeah. Uh, be- below twenty eight weeks, it's dicey. Uh, but uh, you have to look at it. Um, mm. mm-hmm. No one. I don't think there's any doctor who wants to come in the morning and say, uh, "We don't want your baby to go home." Mm. But. Um, we look at it if worse comes to worse you can have another baby but if you're dead you then cannot have no another chance baby of that. Yeah. Mm. so you find it's in those mothers who maybe have children at home it's easier to have this conversation I tell them look mm. you have a baby at home and not badly not badly Yeah. you, you leave a man with a small child the most likely thing less than 2-3 months you'll have a new mother yeah, for these babies. And you pray that that person is a good person. Mm. I think we've all had stories of the stepmother stories. And yeah. I'm not trying to say stepmothers are bad people. I'm sure they're very, but very many. But it's just a risk. Yeah. yeah. There are very, mm. very many women who are out there and are stepmothers and are doing what they're supposed to do uh, for their stepchildren. But I think you've also heard sometimes... It could that go story south. can go yeah. south. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. I'm like, you don't know. And do you really want your child to grow up without you. their mother there? Yeah. So uh, for such people, you're able to put them in that situation. They're able to make a decision. But for those who don't have... Then it's, it's a bit difficult. It's a bit, it's a bit difficult, mm. yeah. But the thing that you've reiterated is clinics are very important. Yes. You have to have regular checkups. You have to know what's going on. And just constantly, because you've said first time mothers are diligent, but then people who've probably given birth a few times, they think, ah, see, it was okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm okay. So that's something that our audience should take away from. That's something that you guys should take home. You should have regular clinics. If you're a first time mom, if you're a third time mom, 10th time mom, just... (laughs) (laughs) Kwanzaa that one. (laughs) (laughs) The risks are probably higher. And I think because time is uh, uh, not on our side, unfortunately, I don't know why time in Endanga, time just goes by so fast. But I've enjoyed this conversation. Perhaps you could give our audience a parting shot. What's one thing that they should take away from this conversation? Okay. Um, A simple blood pressure reading can save your life. 
make sure you go for clinic. Uh, we are able to diagnose and we're able to manage. The sooner we know, the better. Uh, sorry, it's one of those things also I forgot. You find that um, the severe, severe complications we find, you hardly see them mm -hmm. in private settings. And yet in public settings, we see them. And it's just the difference is the diligence and the amount of, um, what do you call it, um, surveillance that is done yeah. in, in the private setting is much, much more. So complications are picked up much, much earlier yeah. and acted upon mm. earlier. So it's mm. not that the, the, the patient, it's just the patients are getting that. So ensure we go for our clinics and ensure we're getting the right, uh, the right care. I love that. I love that. I think that's a beautiful note to end it at. I hope you've taken something away from this conversation. If not, just remember, take go to clinics, especially if, you know, you're a expectant lady. You never know. They could pick something up. It could be preeclampsia. It could be something else. It's better for you to be aware early and take care of it than get to a point where it's a complication. And I think that's it for us today. I've had a lovely conversation with Dr. Maureen. It's been very informative. And I hope you have enjoyed this conversation as well. We will have another interesting conversation next week. So come back. Same time, same place. My name is Cheryl Blessing. And this is the One Health Podcast, the Explained Edition. Thank you.